I've been talking about the fact that we can do research from a Christian, from a creationist point of view. And I'm going to go through uh, three, three examples that, I, that I've been doing myself. <clears throat> this is on the, the Coconino Sandstone, first one. Well, let's see. If you turn this on. Interface between science and faith in terms of actually doing research. Science is a search for true explanations. We hope that's the case anyway. Um, explanations based on evidence. So that's what we'll try to do here. My first example, what was the paleo environment of the Permian, Permian Coconino Sandstone? Paleo environment means what environment was it formed in uh, initially? And that's a, been a talk of, topic of discussion, an argument for some time. Um, the accepted answer, that is the standard uh, uh, answer, is it was in, deposited in an Aeolian desert wind deposit of sand. Aeolian means wind deposited in a, in a desert. Okay, so is there evidence for that? Well, yeah, there is evidence that it is used to support that. Um, you have um, the, the desert, the dune, the wind will blow and carry sand over the top of the dune and deposit sloping layers on one side. And here we have the same kind of sloping layers in, in the sandstone. Uh, we call that cross-bedded sandstone. And so it does have that feature. But we can, should ask also, is cross-bedded sand only formed in deserts? And the answer is no. Uh, it forms sand dunes in the deserts and uh, sand waves underwater. And the sand waves really are pretty much the same as sand dunes in terms of the kind of deposit that they make. So either one, and there was a, <coughs> and so wind and water will do similar things to sand. So you can have the same kind of deposit. So which is it? Um, the Coconino Sandstone in the Grand Canyon, if you've ever been there, you may remember there's this white layer near the top, and here in the lower picture there's a close-up. It's a sandstone about um, uh, 100 meters thick in the Grand Canyon area. Okay, it has fossil trackways in it, and that's what I, one of the things that I've studied. So what can you do with fossil tracks? Well. It's actually quite interesting. You, you see, this is a slab from the Coconino, and you see coming down from the top, there's a trackway, which is a, of a, a, a small, a, a smallish invertebrate. So it's coming down near the bottom, and then a bigger trackway, probably a reptile or an amphibian, comes across. And where those two meet, there's a little scuffle, and only one trackway continues. So what happened there on that spot? Um, it looks like somebody got eaten on that very spot several thousand years ago. Uh, sometimes this slab has been called the Terminator or, or, or lunch, in this, lunch on the dunes. Uh, so you, you can tell a lot about behavior uh, from the trackways. All right, so a little more about the sandstone. Uh, the top again is a, is a picture of this kind of cross-fitted sandstone. And on the bottom shows how it forms. The wind is blowing from the right to the left, and it is making layers on the front of that dune. And um, that can make uh, this cross-fitted sandstone. OK, the, the, they're the only fossils you find in the co Coconino are these trackways. The top picture shows a, a very nice trackway. You can see. Um, Several f uh, footprints with the toe marks on the front. And the bottom is the theory of how this formed. Animals are walking in the desert. 
and they, they leave these tracks. Well, <clears throat> a long time ago, Harold Coffin, you may, may have heard of him, he brought me some papers on this trackways, and he asked me uh, if I'd give a little paper on these at, at some meetings. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Well, I read these papers, and it seemed clear to me that some research was needed. This was actually the event that started me into geology and paleontology. I had to re retrain with classes and everything, too. But anyway, uh, I've been doing that for years. <clears throat> so here you have two possible paleo environments. The top, you have the desert and the animals walking on the dunes. On the bottom, you have these underwater d dunes with animals which can swim and walk down, drop down and walk on the sand. So, which is right. Um, the, the geological community has no doubt. They're, they're very sure that it's uh, the top one, an Aeolian desert environment. But I, I wasn't convinced. It's one of these another situation where the Bible causes us to ask questions that others are not asking and wonder what's going on. So, first of all, go out and study a lot of tracks out in the, in the, on the rocks and in museums. This is when I had hair, my hair was a different color. Um, and so here are some, some trackways. There's a very nice one along the top. Um, uh, clear toe marks, clear toe prints. The bottom one, is, there's, they're bigger tracks. They're not as clear, but they still have uh, toe marks. So these, these details are commonly found in those tracks. So what environment were they made in? Well, I don't have, <coughs> I don't have a time machine that works. So I can't go back and see how it happened. So we can do experiments. Um, so the, 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 on the left you see a, a, an artificial sand dune made by a student of mine. And then in the bottom, this is a, a, another sloping surface like the cross beds in, a, in a, an aquarium. So that's underwater. So I could let animals walk in these two situations and see what the tracks were like. Okay, so at the bottom you see the fossil tracks. And then you, you see two examples of uh, the, the lab tracks on the top. Um, on the right, you see one made underwater. This is on a sloping surface, so the sand will slide and, and cover all the details. The one on the left, underwater, the sand is more stable, and then you see a trackway made there. Now, you look at those and decide which one you think is more like the fossil tracks. Only the underwater tracks have, have the kind of details that are preserved in the fossil tracks. So it looks to me like this says it was underwater. So I did a series of these kind of experiments and then published a paper on these, and which suggests that it's underwater. <clears throat> and then um, I saw some other kinds of tracks also on the sandstone. Um, this is on the right is a slab that's about um, four meters high. And you see tracks walking all over it. Now, one peculiar thing about these tracks, these, these are on, on dunes. And the animals are all walking up the dunes. There was one track found of, of a walking down the dune. It was so unique that a paper was published on that trackway. So why are they all going up the dunes? Well, I won't really give you an answer, but anyway, to keep that in mind, they're all going up the dunes. So you see, if they walk straight up the dunes, they make a normal kind of trackway. But these others are going um, various directions across the dune. And those all have one feature in common. The toes are all pointing up the dune, uh, including the tracks that are walking sideways. The, the animals, are, are their, their toes are going this way, but they're moving sideways. Try that uh, on the basketball court. Well, don't try it. Anyway, animals, animals don't walk that way. So what's going on here? Um, now, the, uh, when animals are walking are on a, well, when you're on a sand dune in a storm, the wind, if you're up against the, the face of the dune, you're not getting hit by the wind. Because the wind comes over the top. Here's the dune surface, and it's kind of going over the top like this. You can, you can check this out, go into a desert, 
uh, in a windstorm and crouch down at the base of a dune. It's going over your head. But you could have lateral winds moving sideways. So maybe a, a wind could be moving the animal sideways. Well, if that's what's happening, the animal's walking on the sand. If the wind is strong enough to move him, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to blow away any tracks that are being made. So that doesn't seem very realistic. But if he's underwater, his body weight is being uh, carried a lot by, by buoyancy in the water. So I, I hypothesize that an animal could be underwater, a gentle current moving to, to the side and making him make those kind of tracks. Well, is that real? Is that going to happen? Again, my time machine wasn't working, so I had to do some experiments. Um, so at the top you see a really distinct one. The tra toes are all pointing up, but the animal's moving sideways. So um, in this uh, device we call a flume, it's water in there and it's moving sideways from a, because of a pump. Um, the animal can walk in there and there's a, there's a video camera recording what is happening. So if the animal tries to move sideways across the, the, uh, the flume, and the, the current is going this way, and he's trying to go this way, it could move him sideways. And I recorded this on a video camera, and it turns out when, they, when they're doing that, it makes tracks just like the fossil tracks. You see like the one on the upper right, he's trying to go that way, but it's moving him sideways so his toes are pointing up. So that seems to, to work. And here's, here's a, a one... Um, figure from the public paper that I published from this. Um, and the trackways here are all traced from an actual fossil slab, a rock slab. The, the drawings of the animal's body, that's my th hypothesis of what's happening. Uh, take the one on the, on the uh, upper right. He's, he's moving along straight forward, and then a, a, side, a lateral current comes and pushes him to the side. He's still trying to go up. And then the current stops and he goes up. So that, that hypothesis can explain all of these uh, unusual trackways. So <clears throat> that again, I, I, I think favors my hypothesis of underwater. The, there's something else I found. Well, let's say, what if, you, what if you find this? You've got to start somewhere. So where did he come from? Now, if it's a bird, they can easily fly down and walk and then take off. But these are not birds. These are, are four-footed animals. And I, in fact, did find slabs like this. These two, uh, in each case, the animal is walking up to the upper left. And so you can see the trackway. If you look backwards behind the track, you should find more tracks there. But they're not there. There, there, are, no, there are no tracks back in here where he should be coming from. So how did he get there on the sand dune? Uh, to me, there's only one uh, explanation that will work. And that is he, he's underwater. So if he's on a sand dune, um, I have no idea how you could do that. And nobody's ever been able to give me a, an explanation of how it could happen. If he's underwater, it's easy. He swims down, he walks, and he swims up and goes away. So again, it seems to favor underwater. Um, here's my best slab. <clears throat> you see this trackway is going up this way, and then it ends. And then the same one, or a, the one just the same, starts up there and continues. Okay, I don't, I don't see any way you can do that unless he's underwater. Um, so... So uh, this, uh, this was published in another paper, and this was interesting. The, the community firmly believes these, these are our, our dunes, Aeolia. The, uh, I mentioned that um, some ideas develop um, as to how they think it happened, and they may be, may be kind of loose at first. But after a while, they, those opinions, like this is a desert, they become hardened, uh, like rock. Okay, this, these papers happened to get published um, before that had really hardened into that uh, dogma, dogmatic opinion that is 
being held since then. So this paper was published in 1991. Um, <clears throat> so how, why do they know that these are, are Aeolian uh, in, on desert dunes? Well, for, for some years earlier, there was an argument about this. Well, um, it, it was hard to decide how to tell a difference between Aeolian, wind deposited, or underwater uh, sand, sand dunes. That hardened into a very strong um, opinion that these were desert. Um, and so the, the, it, the, this idea was based on some minor features in the sediment that you can still argue about, I, I'm quite sure. Um, but it was also a choice. The desert dune explanation fits better in a millions of years worldview um, than a subaqueous deposit. If these were underwater, that begins to sound a little bit too much like a biblical explanation. It's not, it's not welcome. So, but I managed to get those, those published. I'd never get them published if I tried to do it now. <clears throat> so is there any evidence that does not fit this paleo environment? Well, yes, there definitely is. In fact, there's a whole series of them, but I'll just mention this one. You see across a, a, a pic picture of the side of a deposit with these sets of cross beds going by, across. There's a set of cross beds capped by a horizontal surface, then another set capped by a horizontal surface. So they're divided into these sets. And uh, the, 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 the horizontal lines are called bounding surfaces. <clears throat> so to do this, what happens to happen is a dune, a set of dunes is moving across the area depositing these, these surfaces. And then another dune comes on the top and shaves off the top and smooths off the top and makes one of these bounding surfaces. <clears throat> so that's, that's the, the published theory of how this happens. Um, there's one basic problem in this. Well, they, they desperately need that process to make these bounding surfaces because they're you can see they're very prominent in these cross-bedded sandstones. The problem is, this has never been, ever been observed in modern sand dunes. I mean, nowhere. There are, there are lots of deserts around the world, and this has never been observed. But you might ask, well, how do I know? I've never, I haven't seen all of them. That's true. But their theory desperately needs that process. Uh, and if, if they had ever observed even one of these uh, bounding surfaces forming, I'm sure there'd be pictures and papers on it uh, all over. Well, it's never been observed. So how does this happen? Well, <clears throat> it never has been, ha been seen. It's strictly an assumption that this can do, can do this. Just an assumption with no evidence for it. <clears throat> but you, know, you, can, you can form these bounding surfaces easily underwater. One of our graduate students has done this in a, in a flume. Uh, but it, there's no evidence that they can happen in a desert, and yet they're determined to have this Aeolian explanation. So an, what's an assumption? Assumption is a thing that is accepted as true or is certain to happen without proof. So an assumption is not based on convincing evidence. An assumption is accepted by faith. So the assumption of the Aeolian interpretation of the Coconino Sandstone is accepted by faith. Okay, the assumption of the biblical worldview and the subaqueous interpretation is accepted, at least partly, also, by faith. We haven't seen it happen. But there is a lot of evidence that, that points to the subaqueous interpretation. We could t spend the whole the rest of this week going through those, but I won't bore you with that. Uh, I'd fall asleep anyway. But um, We've accumulated evidence really says this can't be Aeolian. It has to be underwater. And <clears throat> so before the, before the opinion got hardened too firmly uh, on, these, on this process, the desert process, we published several papers. Um, okay, I guess that's the end. No, okay. I go to the next one. But anyway, so we published several papers and we published some recently on other features of the sandstone. But I, I'm convinced that as I've come to the point where I'll no longer get papers published on that because they're, they're, they're too, too suspicious of what I'm getting to. <laughs>
where I'm going with this, okay? So someday I'll maybe have to just publish, publish myself something, a summary. And I'll look forward to doing that. Anyway, uh, another research project. <coughs> I'll have to hurry along. Um, Taphonia of fossil whales in the Miocene Pisco Formation in Peru. So myself and some collaborators worked on this. They, uh, this is the, the Peruvian desert, uh, these layers of sand and diatom skeletons, uh, which used to go all the way over to the Andes Mountains that you can see dimly in the distance. And this is where the fossil whales are. Um, if you, in the geologic column, this formation is up near the top. So it's, you know, whether it's before the flood or during the flood, that's a little, you know, interesting question. But, um, I mean, after the flood or during the flood. So here's the situation that they're found in. And there, there are amazing sand dunes in the, in the area. Uh, and this is the, the uh, fossilized formation, the, the rock formation. It's, um, there is no rain here, just period. I've seen an uh, estimate of, I mean, a, a summary one millimeter per year. Okay, so you don't have all this green stuff covering up the fossils like, like the biologists like. So it's wonderful. You can see them clearly, and it's uh, this is our, our our nicest campsite. We called it Brujita Hilton. That hill was the, called the Brujita. Um, so it was fascinating subject. There are lots of fossils there: uh, fo sharks, dolphins, uh, penguins. But we focused on the, sh on the whales. A uh, whale skeleton it, it has a huge skull, and then all the vertebrae, co vertebral column, and the front limbs and ribs. That's what, that's what they have. And if you look to the left, there's a whale in the desert. Now the wind and the sand has covered it partly, and it's kind of beat up, but it's all there. The, the, the skull up at the top and the, the vertebrae come around. And there, there are thousands of these, and they're, all, they're pretty much all articulated. Here's another one, the, the, the skull down here and the vertebral column going along partly covered. One more, it's, it's, it's all there, but it's battered up, uh, the skull and the vertebral column. Um, here's one more. And um, doc, this is Dr. Chadwick who worked with me on this research. He does a dinosaur dig every summer in Wyoming. Uh, you can, you can all go and volunteer there if you want to. Uh, but we used his, his very sophisticated GPS system to locate the position of every whale. So we can make a, a good map of the whales. Here's an aerial photograph of one of our study areas, and every dot is a fossil whale. So this is about two and a half square kilometers, over 400 whales. Okay, and this formation goes for several hundred kilometers to the south. So this is an amazing uh, formation. It's the, uh, the, the, the whales are in diatom skeletons. Their diatoms are microscopic creatures that live in the water. They die and their skeletons sink to the bottom. And they're beautifully preserved. Now in the modern world, these diatoms die in the ocean, sink to the bottom, and they, they, most of them get dissolved, but they accumulate a few centimeters per thousand years. Okay, and that was how this was all interpreted by the geologists and paleontologists who worked here. The whales were in this stuff buried a few centimeters every thousand years. Um, okay, but what happens today when whales die? Okay, there are people who study this kind of thing. Uh, this is in, off the coast of California, um, a pictures from one of their publications. The whale dies and that's an enormous amount of food thousands of creatures settle on it and begin to eat. And in about six months, the flesh is gone and it looks like this. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, the next crew comes in and they start boring on the bones, chewing on the bones. And within a few years, the bones are gone. Okay, the, bone, the whale is gone in a few years. Okay, you're going to bury a whale this big, a few centimeters every thousand years. Um, think about that. It's going to take 10,000 years to bury a whale. Well, it isn't going to happen. They, they die, they're gone in a few years. Um, but here we have our whales, our beautiful whales, and even the baleen, uh, the, the, the sieving mechanism in the mouth, you can see on the left, it's, it's all fossilized there. 
And when a whale dies, that stuff falls out in a few days. But here it is. And in many whales, we had the baleen preserved. Uh, and here's a mouthful. Uh, the bottom one is the fossil. Um, and it's, you can see the whole mouthful of baleen. Well, that might be debatable now, but anyway, that's the a, that's a baleen like you see up in that whale. Okay, it's there. This was not buried over 10,000 years. This was buried very, very rapidly. This is a, a, one of our whales. We call this one Carmen, beautifully preserved. Um, and uh, there's two more. There's, well, this, the left, uh, left one is about six feet long, just two, two meters. But most of them are big, I'll uh, say 20, 30 meters. And this is our favorite one, Fernanda. We'd, we excavated this one. It was buried, <clears throat> so it wasn't covered by the, the wind-blown sand. Beautiful whale. Fernanda, it's all there. There are no, the bones have not been bored into or, or chewed on. It's just well-preserved. And um, right on that flip, flipper over there, there was a slab of baleen that came out of the mouth and drifted over and landed on top of that flipper. So, um, so there's that, the bottom one is that, is that baleen. And we could study that uh, very, uh, took, brought samples home and studied it. And uh, here's some close-ups, um, uh, cross-sections of the baleen. And then you see that that uh, reddish spot over there, that's where the actual baleen is, is preserved, is exposed. And this is a, a microscopic view of it. That's protein. This thing's supposed to be 12 million years old, and that's protein. I sent, I sent a sample of this to Mary Schweitzer, who's an expert on this kind of study of, of fossil uh, molecules. And she identified that that's baleen. It was a soft material, uh, which is protein. And she made a, uh, a, a, a picture of this from an electron microscope. So that's a very high resolution uh, picture. And it's, you see all these detailed layers within the protein. 10,000 years to bury it? No, not, not a chance. Um, weeks, months maybe, at the most. And here's the, the crew on the, by that whale. And so um, we studied several, some hundreds of these whales and they 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 clearly were very rapidly um, fossilized. Um, they 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 were not beached whales. They they floated and sank in shallow bays. And uh, how did, why did they die? Well, probably for at least two reasons. There, this is a this there's a lot of volcanic ash in this sediment from the volcanoes in the in the Andes Mountains. Breathing volcanic ash is not healthy. Uh, it, it's full of little sharp glassy shards. So that's a problem. And also these massive diatom blooms will produce toxins which can kill large mammals. And so probably those two things were the reason there are so many dead whales there. And they were, they were probably also, they were probably coming, ac accumulating here to uh, feed on the, the diatoms. Here's a what's called a marine snow. That's diatom mats in the water. And so um, we, we published, we, we wrote up a paper and submitted it to geology, which is a, a prestigious geology research journal. And we had some good reviewers who understand very well the process of fossilization. And I had a chance actually to discuss this personally with a couple of them. And they said, yeah, your evidence clearly says this, these are buried very rapidly. And so they understood the process, and they knew that I, that I was on the right track. And so this got published in other, other papers as well. So when did this massive whale death occur? I think probably late in, in the flood. These were not buried instantly, but uh, for each whale, probably uh, uh, weeks or months at most. I had an interesting situation. I, I was writing up this paper, and I was thinking, to, you know, I know that there was a very strong feeling against trying to explain these by rapid burial. So I thought, well, the evidence says weeks or months at most for any whale. 
But I didn't think that ever got published. So I kind of toned it down a little bit. I said, you know, months or a few years. And one of my reviewers, who one I hadn't talked to personally, knew this research. She, she said, uh, well, you know, your evidence really says it was faster than that, uh, weeks or months. <laughs> so I put that back in, and that got published. <clears throat> Conclusions, the numerous fossil oils are well preserved. There's no indication of any condition, no special condition that would inhibit decay. They just had to be buried very rapidly. And the, the diatomite uh, accumulated several orders of magnitude faster than it usually does. But we had some explanations for why that could happen. Um, so, we, okay, after we finished this work and published our paper, um, a couple of papers, uh, a big research group from Europe came and studied those same whales. So they knew what we'd done. In fact, they cited our papers, used some of our evidence. But again, they were more th conventional thinking scientists. They didn't like the idea of rapid burial. And so they reinterpreted all of this. They, they came up with three explanations for why the things that could help to preserve them. And uh, I won't try to get into all that, but uh, it's fairly clear to me, and from what is in the literature, that none of their processes were going to work. They were they were desperate to get keep from deposits from burying these rapidly, and yet they, they had to be. They had to be buried rapidly. There was no no other what process that will work. Um, after we later uh, put together, my graduate student and I put together another paper, a fairly sizable paper on the. How the fossilization process and submitted it to a journal and one of the reviewers had kind of nitpicking responses and then he finally he said well this is interesting research but you people are well known creationists we can't trust you so the paper got rejected well we submitted it to another journal and fortunately got different reviewers and it got published and the editor said well, we think this is going to be a very important paper so you, you Publishing things like the, like we do, there's this little dance you go through, a dance with reviewers and editors, trying to say it carefully so you don't get them too nervous. And you may get it published, you may not. Okay, one quick one. I've got a few minutes for this. Taphonomy of fossil turtles in the Eocene Bridger Formation in Wyoming. There's a formation in Wyoming that has thousands of fossil turtles. This is the formation, or this is our camp. And... Uh, if you dig, there, the two students are excavating a large turtle, and you dig in the sand and you get um, lots of fossils, especially turtles, lots of turtles. Uh, and they're all, the, the, the shells are all complete. They have uh, no, no heads and very few limb bones. There are, there are three, on this hillside, there are exposed three uh, limestone beds, and in each case you have turtles Lots of turtles just up in the mudstone, just above the limestone. Um, now they're they're all in the same stage of decay. It's like this whale. I mean, the, sorry, this cow died, and the, the insects ate of his flesh, and then in a year or so, it looks like this. Well, there's a process that animals go through when they die, and if all your animals are in the same state of decay and disarticulation, that means they're all buried at the same time which was the case with our turtles. Um, the, the sediment here is from volcanics, volcanoes, northern, northern uh, Wyoming. Volcanic ash, which has been um, altered to sandstone and, and limes and uh, shale. And so that's, that's what killed and buried the turtles. Um, and each of these layers covers hundreds of, of square miles. It's a very large area. It's, you find them along this hillside. And one thing paleontologists need to know is to, to map the different layers. And nobody had done this. We, we did this. And I won't go into the detail here. But uh, I think there, there's a philosophical reason why we saw this as something we could do. The others didn't think you could. But we started working on it, and we mapped them all. And this has been published. Um, now there's... We were able to publish the evidence that each of these mass mortality layers was, was killed and deposited very rapidly. They had to be. Not immediately, because the, the turtles had lost their heads 
and a lot of their limbs, and that happens fairly fast. Um, but the, the shells were there. Now, so that got published. But we had one advantage in, in these different projects. You can publish your data up to a certain point, but there are certain things you, you can't say or you, they won't get published. You can only go so far in your explanations. Okay, the, my reviewers uh, agreed that the, the evidence said these were buried rapidly. But there's something else we observe which we, we would never get published. Um, here you have hillside. The black line is a limestone. The turtles are above this limestone. And then up there, there's another limestone. And if you take the radiometric dates, that's about 200,000 years between limestones. Okay, and that, that, all that sediment is, represents environments that would be good for turtles. You should find turtles all the way up through that if, the, if this was time going by. But you don't. This is the way it should be. You should have turtles all the way up there, broken up and, and marsh, mostly broken up. But this is what we find. So I would, to me, that's evidence that this, there was not 200,000 years here. This was happened all quite rapidly. But um, if I tried to publish that, they would just uh, they would not publish it. So you can you can publish your evidence up to a point. And then you, you just can't do any more because of the, of the very firmly established dogmas um, that have been accepted. So that's our bridger. We were able to get papers published, several papers published uh, on this project. And here are two things that, that, that anti-creationists have stated. No creationist has contributed a single article to any reputable scientific journal. Okay, another statement, flood geology shows no promise of fruitful interchange with other sciences. It does not see aim to advance science. Okay, would you agree with that? These guys simply don't know what's going on. And I've read, I read all the anti-creationist stuff I can get a hold of, and they clearly, none of them who write those things, understand how an educated creationist thinks. They just don't. So the next two pages are just a list of published research papers by creationists, geologists, or, or paleontology researchers. Okay, so um, each, each of the yellow labels is a name of a journal, and then the smaller t type is, is uh, uh, individual articles. You can't read those, but um, I could show the list later if you want. So there are, there are 20 some. Um, these are mostly myself and my graduate students and other collaborators, and there are a few other people who have, uh, are on some of these journals, these articles. So all of these are done by creationists. Um, so th there's no question that we can do good research and get it published if we're, if we're lucky. 